So I'm a little torn tonight because um, uh, I'm selfishly, I'm a little glad the class is over because it's a little bit of an extra load to have to prepare this every single week. But at the same time, I'm disappointed because this has not only been um, a, an exercise in preparation for me, but, but God has really worked in my heart these last five weeks. And I trust that he's worked in your heart as well. Uh, I feel like I've grown these last five weeks. And, and I mean, not only that I understand sanctification more, but I, but I really feel like God's at work in my life. And, and I trust and I pray that you feel the same. I want you to know that I pray for you. And I've specifically prayed, you know, as I prayed tonight, that it wouldn't just be something that we're learning, but it would be something that is changing our lives. And I, and I promise you I'm going to continue to pray for that. So, so I really struggled with tonight's lesson because um, to try to synthesize sanctification in five weeks is really tough. And um, there was so much that I wanted to say tonight. I really, even upwards of yesterday, was back and forth between, do I want to deal with this topic or do I want to deal with this topic? And um, so I've settled on one, but, but in my heart, now, I still wish we would have had time to deal with another. I really wish we would have had time to go back and spend one more lesson on the work of the Holy Spirit and sanctification. And if I can instill one thing in your hearts in the midst of all of this, and I think we've caught it, is once again, is sanctification is not just something that we produce in our life, but it's something that the Holy Spirit produces in our life. As we dwell on Jesus, he molds us and shapes us into Jesus' image. And uh, I trust that that will be an ongoing reality in your life. I know it's a daily struggle, but at the same time to be learned to be submissive to him. And so tonight I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about, and I kind of would like to have a few minutes at the end for questions, if we have any questions, to take some time to do that. But I wanna talk a little bit about the purpose of suffering and sanctification. Probably not uh, the most enjoyable topic, but, but I think it plays a very, very vital role in God molding us and shaping us into who he wants us to be. So I wanna, I wanna start by reading a passage and then, and then we're gonna say um, hopefully a bunch of things that'll be helpful tonight. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter four. 1 Peter chapter four, and um, I wanna read seven uh, verses 12 through 17. I'm sorry, First Peter chapter four, verses 12 through 17. And we'll get back to this in just a little bit because I kind of want to walk through it because Peter actually shows us how suffering plays into our sanctification and how it plays into us being molded and shaped into the image of Christ. Uh, First Peter chapter four, verse 12. If you have it, I'll read it. You follow along. Peter says, beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. Let me just pause there for a second and say, do you ever wonder why God's been so gracious to us that here in our country, you know, we don't go through as believers, we really haven't gone through fiery trials. I mean, sometimes we act like we do, you know, if we try to share the gospel with us and they kind of turn us off, we act like we're suffering, but we really have not suffered at all for our faith compared to the way believers suffer around the world. And obviously it's just God's grace in our life. Sometimes I, there's a part of me that wishes that, that maybe we suffered a little more because I think it's during times of suffering that the church really catches fire. But I'm not praying that we suffer, so, 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 so don't misunderstand me. But I'm just amazed that at you know, the sovereignty of God, why some places suffer more than others. Anyways, Peter is writing to believers who were going through unbelievable suffering. And he says, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though some strange thing were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you also may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. You were insulted for the name of Christ. You are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. 
Yet if anyone suffers at a Christian, as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? So we'll pause right there. So I have to apologize from the very beginning. So um, 4 o'clock this afternoon, I wrote all of this on, on Monday, and it was filed and ready to go, and gave it to Lorena to prepare everything. And at 4 o'clock this afternoon, I realized that I had accidentally deleted all of my notes off of my computer. So uh, I am, I'm, I'm teaching from your notes today, and I'm teaching from memory. So if I forget a couple of things, I know you'll forgive me, right? Okay, maybe not, maybe not, all right? Suffering is not something that we easily accept, especially in our country. I'm going to say a couple of things that are really bold. If you disagree with me, feel free to chat with me after class. But I think in the United States, we have created a theology that is not biblical. We've created a theology that says God wants us to be healthy, wealthy, prosperous, and be happy. That's actually called prosperity theology. I'm not a fan of prosperity theology for two reasons, because it's not biblical, number one. Number two, it's an American invention. Prosperity theology doesn't fly in Africa. It doesn't fly in India. It doesn't fly in places where Christians are really suffering. And yet that mentality has bled into the church. You maybe have heard people interpret Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5 where, where Isaiah says, And by his stripes we are healed. And some would teach that that healing that, that Isaiah mentions in Isaiah chapter 5 is a physical healing and that Jesus died so that we could be healthy and not only healthy, but that he would heal our finances and he would heal all of our problems. Um, I just don't see it in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul was not a wealthy man. And if you look at the end of all 12 of the disciples, all of them ended their life giving their life for the Lord. That doesn't seem prosperous and that doesn't seem happy to me. And so, 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 so I put this in your notes because I want you to catch it because God's ultimate, let me say like I have it in the notes, God's ultimate goal is not your happiness, all right? It's not your happiness. God's ultimate goal is your holiness. That, that is so very important. God's not up in heaven sitting back saying, man, the most important thing I want for Al or the most important thing I want for Betty is I want them to be happy above everything else. No, what God wants is our holiness. And, and God wants to mold us into his image. And as we're going to see in the passage, many times that only happens through fiery trial. It only happens through what some people use, uh, uh, what some people call as the refiner's fire. As God passes us through the refiner's fire. And so um, I think it's important that we understand that, that suffering is a part of our present life. And we know that, and we know it's a part of our present life for two reasons. Number one, read Romans chapter 8. So suffering is nothing more than a result of the fall. So not only are we suffering, but all of creation is suffering and groaning, waiting for the liberation that is only going to take place when Jesus Christ comes back and he liberates us from the freedom and the power of sin and the bondage of sin. All right. So as long as we live in a sinful world, guess what we're going to have? We're going to have suffering. It's a part of who we are. But the second thing is that God uses it as a tool in our lives. That's how I, why I've, I've titled the lesson this way, Suffering, God's Tool for Sanctification. 
because I believe that God uses it in our lives and we can't always explain why. And you know, you like many people will come to me and say, Brian, I just don't get it. Why are these people suffering greatly and these people aren't suffering greatly? And there's no way that you and I can comprehend the infinite mind of God nor comprehend exactly what he's doing in all of his sovereignty. What I do know though is that God uses it in our lives. So I say this in your notes, the scriptures present suffering as an integral part of the Christian life. It is useful for God to produce change in us. Of course, that doesn't make it easy, right? Suffering is never easy. To the contrary, it's extremely difficult. Nevertheless, to have a proper view of suffering helps us to cope as we understand what God is trying to do in our lives. So remember we started, can somebody remember what's the passage of scripture that we began this whole series with? Anybody remember? Romans chapter 8, verses 28, 29, and 30. For all things work together for good to those who love God and for those who are the called according to his purpose. And then Paul went through and says that those who are called, he predestined, he justified, so that we might be conformed, what? To the image of his Son. And so the simple truth is this, that God takes everything and uses it all together for the pulpit purpose of molding us and shaping us into the image of Jesus. Here's just a couple of quotes that that I want to highlight. So Tim Keller says this, and by the way, he says it in this book right here. Has anybody read this book by Tim Keller, Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering? One of the best books on suffering that I have ever read. I would highly, highly, highly recommend this. called Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering. But Tim Keller makes the statement. He says, so suffering is at, the, is at the very heart of the Christian faith. It is not only, it is, excuse me, it is not only the way Christ became like and redeemed us, but is one of the main ways we become like him and experience his redemption. And that means that our suffering, despite its painfulness, is also filled with purpose and usefulness. Does that make sense? So, 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 so Tim Keller is sitting back saying that, that, that God used suffering in Jesus' life to accomplish our redemption. Philippians chapter 2, he humbled himself in the form of a man and, and humbled himself even unto death, even the death of the cross, that, that humiliation to suffering. God used that to accomplish our redemption. And he not only uses suffering in the life of Jesus, but he uses suffering in our lives as well. And then, of course, the famous quote by C.S. Lewis, if you've ever read anything by C.S. Lewis, he makes this statement, he said, pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our consciences, but he shouts in our pains. He says pain is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Um, I can say in my life, there's been several moments in my life that that were like watershed moments in my life where God has just done some remarkable things in my life. I'm not talking about great accomplishments. I'm talking about what God does in my heart. And, and several of those were, first of all, when I had a heart attack at the age of 36. 36, I had my first heart attack, an open heart surgery at 36, sitting down basically out of, out of function for 30 days as a 36-year-old, wondering what does the future hold for me? And that was a time that God just really got a hold of my heart. And the second thing has been a 25-year process, how God has used amber to mold and, and shape both Vicki and I. I say without any hesitation that amber has been one of my greatest teachers in life. And as I watch how she goes through all of her suffering, there are a lot of lessons that God uses to teach me. If we had time, I could probably ask you and you would talk about moments of your li- in your life that were just really important moments, moments of pain that God used to mold you and shape you who do, into who God wants you to be. Um, some have, have made this statement, and it's so true, 
don't waste your pain. (laughs) Don't waste your suffering. And wasting your suffering means to go through something without truly understanding what it is that God wants to accomplish in your life. I remember sitting um, in my lazy boy after my heart attack at 36 years old and sit back asking God over and over again, God, what are you trying to teach me? I don't want to waste this. Number one, I don't want to ever go through it again if I don't have to. So, so you know, help me not to flunk this grade. Help me to pass this grade so I can go on. But God, what is it that you are trying to teach me, wanting to use that moment to accomplish something? That's what C.S. Lewis is saying. By the way, if you ever read C.S. Lewis's biography as well, uh, he's a gentleman who went through a lot of pain in his life. If you haven't read it, I can recommend uh, several books that, that give his biography. But, but as we look at what Peter is talking about here in 1 Peter, let me just mention a couple of things and we'll flesh these out and try to be as practical as can be. So the first thing Peter says is this, that God uses suffering, the word he uses, not the word that I would have used, but the word that Peter uses, and I have to say the Holy Spirit as well, is the word to test you. God uses suffering to test you. And I struggled with that word because in James it says that God doesn't test anyone. And so I sit back and think, wait a second, he tells us that in James, but here he says that he uses fiery trials to test us. And I think we can explain what that means. So notice that verse once again. It says, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. So let me flesh this out a little bit. The, the word surprise there is, a, is an interesting word. It is a hospitality word. So, so it's a word, if you go back in the New Testament times, it's a word that, that was used for hospitality. Let me tell you what I mean through all of that. So, so, so during New Testament times, they didn't have the abundance of hotels and places where people traveling could stay, right? So you couldn't just go into a city and find a hotel and stay there. They had a couple of uh, different places, but most people who were travelers found someone they, someone they knew and showed up on their door and stayed in their house. And so the idea of the word play that Peter is using here is the idea of not knowing that someone is coming to your door and all of a sudden hearing a knock on the door and opening up the door and realizing that you have a guest that you have to attend to. And so what happened during New Testament times is they basically lived in such a way that they were ready for any guests whenever they came. So they were never surprised by a guest. They always had food. They always had something ready to be able to attend to a guest. They were not surprised. That's the word. Now you sit back and say, Brian, how in the world do you pull that from uh, one uh, little word right there? Okay, I didn't do the word study. Somebody else did the word study. But that's the idea that Peter is conveying. So just as in those days you needed to be prepared for any guests that could come, Here's what Peter's saying. Don't be surprised whenever trials come. So so the flip of that is he's saying this. You must be prepared. So the first bullet point I put there is simply this. Be prepared to suffer. That's exactly what Peter's saying in the passage. Don't be surprised when suffering comes. Be prepared to suffer. The idea of the passage is simple. Prepare yourself because in any given moment, suffering may knock at your door. That's exactly what Peter is saying. Let me say it again. Prepare yourself because at any given moment, suffering can come knocking on your door. And if you're not prepared for suffering, it can what? It can destroy you instead of encouraging you. So, so notice what he says. So let's flesh it out. Don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. So, so the next bullet point I put there in your notes is simply this. Suffering purifies you. When he uses the word test there, that, that, that's the idea. 
Are you missing an outline? Do you need an outline? Do, do, do we have an extra outline, V? Do we, do we have, you got one right here? Good. I'm sorry. I want her to be able to f- follow along. Yeah. So, so, so the idea is this. Suffering purifies you. And, and once again, the word picture that Peter is painting, he's painting the, 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 the picture of the refiner's fire. All right, so, so, so all of us are familiar, I think, with, with how gold is purified, right? So when gold is, is mined out of a mountain or gold comes out of a mine, it doesn't come in the shiny, brilliant form that we have today, right? There, there's dirt, there's grime, there's, there's all kinds of different things on it that need to be what? That need to be cleaned, that need to be purified away. And the way gold is purified is is what? It is passed passed through fire. As a matter of fact, if you do a study, it's passed through a fire. They said it's passed through a fire of some 1,800 degrees in order to be able to purify the dross and the dirt and everything on it. And so when gold goes through that refining process of that heat, everything else is burned away, and the only thing is left is what? It's pure gold. The That's the word analogy that Peter is using. He's saying, so don't be surprised whenever the refiner's fire, the fiery trial comes upon you. And, and, And what Peter is saying very simply is this, that God is going to use that fiery trial for the purpose of burning away Everything else that's dirt and grime and mold, everything else that's not brilliant, that doesn't make you look like Jesus, the purpose is to burn all of that away. And the purpose is to purify you. So, so, so that changes. What I'm trying to get you to see tonight is the change of mindset because, because we have a tendency, and I talk to people all the time that are going through suffering, suffering, The first thought that we have when we go through suffering is that God is punishing me. So why is God treating me like this? Why is God punishing me? And we need to realize that the purpose of the suffering is not to punish us. The purpose of the suffering is to purify us. So so it's not a, 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 a mean God who's behind the suffering. It's a gracious, compassionate God who is behind the suffering, who is using it to accomplish in our lives what he wants to accomplish. George MacDonald said this, he said, The Son of God suffered unto death, not that men might not suffer, but that their sufferings might be like his. So, 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 as I thought through this the last couple of days, and we can talk about this if you want to, but, but, doesn't it make sense that if God's goal is to mold us and shape us into his image, how much sense would it be that Jesus suffered, but we wouldn't have to suffer? Does that make sense? Are you following my, my thought process through here? Why would we sit back and say, okay, in order to accomplish God's will in our lives, Jesus had to go through all of the suffering, but we're not going to have to do that. So if we're his followers and we're going to follow in his steps, and we're actually going to see a verse here in just a few minutes that shows us that, wouldn't it make sense that we are going to have to suffer as well? And Paul even said, I think we looked a few weeks ago in Philippians chapter 3, where Paul said that I might know him And he says what? The fellowship of what? The fellowship of his sufferings. And so the simple truth is this, that God uses suffering in our lives to purify us, to remove the dirt, the grime, and the imperfections that hinder us from being like Jesus. So so would you think with me for a second? All right? And this doesn't have to be you know, autobiographical, not by any sense the imagination, but here's a question. What are some practical things that God wants to do in our lives through suffering? Pam? So say that again? Teaches us perseverance. He teaches us to endure. Absolutely. David? Okay, so how does that happen? Absolutely. How does that happen? So, so, so what? It drives you to your knees. 
It absolutely drives you to your knees. So, so his goal is what? For us to spend time with him. He knows that in our carna- carnal fallen state, that if everything's going well, we're probably going to ignore him. And so his job is what? To drive us to him. Absolutely right. How, how else? What are some other practical things that God wants to do in our lives through suffering? Purify us? Absolutely. So maybe there's a sin in our life that, that, that we're oblivious to and God wants to shine light on. Yes, sir? That is a really good question. Let me get back to that. Can I get back to that? And if I don't get back to it, ask me at the end, okay? To do that, 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 that that's a great question. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. To be able to help somebody else who is going through that suffering. That, 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 that's exactly right. So, 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 so to answer this gentleman's question, I'm sorry, I, I don't know your name, but that's a great question. So I think we know it's suffering when, first of all, and, and Peter talks about it here. First of all, we're not being punished for something that we did wrong. So, 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 so it's not like I disobey the law, and, and, and we'll see it in just a second here in First Peter. It's not like I disobey the law, and then I say, well, hey, I'm just suffering for the cause of Christ. No, Peter's saying, if you disobey, you deserve to be punished. He uses the phrase there. He says, if you suffer as a Christian is what he says in the passage. And so the, the idea that I would answer that is, as a result of my faith, as a result of me growing to become more and more like Jesus, there are circumstances that come into my life that maybe are external, maybe they're internal, maybe it's something that God is using, maybe it's something that I'm going through because of my th- faith, but I think there's got to be some real self-examination there. I think at times, and you make a great point, I think at times we call things suffering that aren't necessarily suffering. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. And he kind of talks about it here. He, he, he says, don't suffer as an evildoer. That, that, that's not suffer. Suffer as a Christian. Great thoughts. Great thoughts. Notice number two. Notice what Peter says, and, and we'll get into this just a little bit more. Peter says that God uses suffering then to help us rejoice. Now, that, that's kind of crazy to think that way, but, but I want you to see grammatically what he says, all right? So verse 12, he says, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, comma, you, you really, the next phrase just modifies that, all right? But he says what? But rejoice as you share Christ's sufferings. In other words, what he's saying is, don't be surprised, don't be unprepared when suffering comes. Rather, the opposite of being unprepared, the opposite of being surprised is what? Rejoice when the suffering comes. Now, now who rejoices in the midst of suffering? Uh, I mean, that's tough. It's really tough. But that's exactly what he says. He says, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. So as crazy as it sounds, Peter mentions here in the passage two reasons why you and I should rejoice in the suffering that we endure. Let me give them to you. The first is this, because we share Christ's sufferings. That's what he says, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. Let me tell you what it doesn't mean, all right? It doesn't mean that, that our suffering accomplishes what Jesus' suffering accomplished. Philippians chapter 2, his suffering accomplished what? It, it, it accomplished our redemption. It, reco- it accomplished our salvation. His suffering, I'd use two words to describe his suffering that you can't use for ours. It was efficacious in the sense that it accomplished something, and number two is vicarious. He didn't suffer for himself. He suffered for someone else. Our suffering is not efficacious in the fact that it's powerful and it's not vicarious. We're not suffering for someone else. So what is he talking about when he says that we share in his sufferings? I want to show you a verse. I, uh, I'm not sure whether it's in your notes or not, but First Peter 2, verses 20 and 21. I love these verses. I've loved them for years. Notice what Peter says. But if when you do good, this is what our our brother said, but if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure. 
This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. But then notice what he says. For to this you have been called. Now, so, so he uses the term that we've been called. So we've been called to what? Well, what is he saying? We've been called to what? We've been called to suffer. That's what he's saying. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure. That's a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you've been called. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. So in other words, he left us an example of suffering, knowing what? That we were going to come behind him and that we in turn would suffer as well. I simply said two things there is this. Jesus' suffering is our model. If we want to know how to suffer, Jesus is the model. Jesus is the example. It says he left us an example that we should follow in his steps. And the second thing, I think it's in your notes as well. I said, doesn't it make sense that we will suffer because he suffered? And once again, God in his sovereignty chooses that some people suffer more than others. I mean, why is it that we can come here and we can study God's word tonight free and we don't have to worry about anything? And today, somewhere around the world, there's believers that are huddled together in the dark, scared to death that somebody's going to catch them studying God's word. Why did, it, why did God choose that? That's in his sovereignty. Why, why are some people healthy their entire lives and don't hardly have any problems until God takes them home? And then there's other people whose life is filled with pain and sorrow and loss after loss after loss. Why is that? We don't know. That, that, that's all in the sovereignty of God. But the simple truth is this, that God has called us to suffer in one way or another. Paul talks a lot about suffering. And he talks a lot about rejoicing. And the most rejoicing he did when he was singing songs and hymns to God during his worst and most suffering time. Absolutely. We talked about that Sunday in, in the prison epistles. Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4, Rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice. He wrote that from a prison cell. He didn't write it from the Marriott, you know. He, he, he wrote it while he was in prison. So, so <laughs> Probably so, probably so, Ray. It's right there. Absolutely, absolutely, Ray. Thank you for reminding us of that. And so we rejoice, why? Because we share in Christ's sufferings. I think that's kind of what Paul was sitting back saying. Paul was sitting back saying, listen, I want to know Jesus so much. I want to understand. I want to have the fellowship of his sufferings. I don't think Paul was saying, you know, beat me harder, beat me more. I don't think he was saying anything like that. But I think he was saying, listen, as I go through this, I want to experience it. I want to understand that. I want to follow in Jesus' steps. So in your outline, I said this, you share with Christ's sufferings. And the th second thing is this, you are blessed. <laughs> That is just so, it's the antithesis of what we think, all right? I mean, we look at people that are blessed, and we see people who are healthy, and people who have a lot, and we say, boy, those people have been blessed. But here's what Peter's saying. Whenever you share in the sufferings of Christ, you are blessed. Notice it right there in the text, right? Verse 14, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. That's exactly what he's saying. What a total change in the way we view suffering. So Peter says, suffering is not a burden. Suffering is a blessing. Let that kind of sink in your minds right now. Suffering is not a burden. Suffering's a blessing. So, so, so in th think through how we even pray about suffering all right so, so I'm not I'm not talking to you I'm talking about me so we're going through suffering all right so let's just imagine 
one of us is going through suffering. So one of us is going through, uh, you know, whether it's an illness or something like that. And that person is here with us tonight. And if they asked a prayer request, their prayer request probably would be, please pray with me that God would relieve me of this suffering, right? That, that's how we pray when we're going through a suffering. God, get me out of this. God, God, get me out of it as fast as I can. Instead of sitting back praying from a different perspective, God, help me to see your purpose in the suffering. And God, help me to be a blessing. And I don't want to get ahead because we're going to see that exactly in the passage. It changes our mindset. I don't think it means that we don't have the desire to be healed. I don't think it means that we don't have the desire to get out of the financial crisis. I don't think it means that we don't have the desire to restore that relationship that's broken. But I think as a believer, it helps us to see the suffering from a different perspective. We see it from God's perspective that God is accomplishing something in our lives. And so our prayer, along with God, please heal me, our prayer should be, God, please grow me. God, please bless me. God, please use me in the midst of all of that. Because if not, as we mentioned a few moments ago, we waste that suffering opportunity. Now, how is it? that we can view it as a blessing. He answers that in the passage. Verse 14, if you were insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, notice what he says, because the spirit of glory and God rests upon you. The spirit of glory and God rests upon you. Okay, let me, let me put that in just Brian's translation of that. Here's what it is. Because God is accomplishing his good work in you. So Paul says this, realize you're blessed. Why? Because God's spirit is upon you. And the spirit of glory is at work in you. In the midst of this tribulation. I tell you, some of the most powerful stories I've ever heard are are stories of people who have suffered well. And we can list people, all of you know people that have suffered well. Oh my word, read, read the story of Joni Erickson Tada. Oh my word, has she suffered well. We've had Bernadette Todd here. You remember the story, remember Bernadette, remember the lady that we've had in the wheelchair the, the, that's here that's told her story. Bernadette has suffered well. Anybody, um, there, was a, the, the, there was a special maid of the pastor's wife in, in Colorado. I think her name was Kara Tippett. Has anybody read that story or watched that documentary? You need to watch that documentary. I watched it. I sat and bawled through that documentary. Here's a pastor's wife that had cancer, has three little kids, I think, and has cancer, and they document her through her suffering. And you see the joy as she goes through it. Obviously the pain, she realizes she's not gonna be with her kids as they grow up, as they graduate, as they get married, and there's pain there. But you see the joy and the suffering and she shares her heart of what God is doing in her life and through her life, through this suffering. And so when you suffer, you're blessed because you realize that God is accomplishing his good work in your life. And as I mentioned, it's what we talked about in the beginning, Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. Let me show you a third thing, and then I want to get to a couple applications at the end, and then hopefully we'll be done in time to uh, have a few questions. The third thing is this. God uses suffering to help us glorify him. He says that in the passage. Verse, verse uh, 15, he says, but let none of you suffer, uh, what our brother said, let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. So God uses suffering to help you glorify God. Two truths. Let me mention them. First is this. Through your suffering, you glorify God. Somebody, somebody um, give me an example of somebody you know who glorified God through their suffering. Can somebody give me an example of that? 
Pam? Yeah. So there's an example of how even through her suffering, God was glorified. That, that leads us to the second point there that in your notes. It says, through your suffering, you glorify God to others. So you not, not only glorify God to God, but you glorify God to others. An example of what you're talking about there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Toby Mack's 21-year-old son died last week. And the testimony that Toby and his wife have given in response to that has been very God-honoring and very God-glorifying. Absolutely, absolutely. So here's the idea. When believers handle suffering rightly, they are not merely glorifying God to God. They are showing the world something of the greatness of of God. I want to give you a biblical example, okay? So, so turn with me to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. And let's read an example in Acts chapter 7 and see if you catch it. How, how God was glorified, not just to God, but how God was glorified to others. Acts chapter 7, I, I'm going to read it for time's sake from verses 54 through 60, all right? Acts chapter 7, beginning in verse 54. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged. So Stephen had just preached that great message. When they heard what Stephen had preached, they were enraged. They ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And Stephen said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. And they cast him out of the city and stoned Owned him, and the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So first of all, the question is this, how did Stephen endure suffering there? He endured it well, right? Uh, uh, I mean, he wasn't crying out to God, say, God, what are you doing right here? I mean, uh, uh, I mean, he is glorifying God even at the moment of his death. So, so catch this. Did you catch this? So what was the result of his faithfulness during suffering? It's not a trick question. Saul saw it. You think that had any impact at all on Saul? Of course it had an impact on Saul. There's no doubt about it. If I, if I had time, I could go to Saul's testimony. You could prove that, 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 that his wording, scholars said that some of the wording that, that, that Paul uses when he gives his conversion testimony somehow bounced back to this passage right here. There's no doubt that when he watched Stephen suffer, He saw something different in Stephen that stuck with him. I can't say that that's exactly what caused Paul to become a Christian because Paul didn't become a Christian until the Damascus Road, until he had a vision of Jesus. But I don't think there's any doubt that Stephen's testimony during suffering made a huge impact on Paul and was a pivotal point in Paul becoming a believer. Here's a great verse 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 10. Paul talks about it this way. He says, Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Here's one last thought, and, and, and I'll ask you a couple of questions and we'll move on. So it's interesting that the words suffering and glory are linked in a surprising number of biblical passages. As a matter of fact, that'd be a great word study for you to do. 
go home and study how often you find the word suffering and glory found together in the same passage. Why is that? Because God is glorified through the suffering of believers. And God wants to be glorified through our suffering as well. I gave you just a couple of examples there. There's more, more of them. So, so, so can I ask us just a couple of introspective questions as we think through this? The first is this. Are you spiritually mature enough to see suffering as God sees it? Now, it's easy for us on this side to say, oh, yeah, I could do that. Kind of like I read this morning, you know, Peter there. The Lord said, uh, you're going to deny me. And Peter's like, oh, no, man, I'll never deny you. Never. Uh, I'm with you till death. And just a few hours later, here's Peter denying him not once, twice, three times. He didn't have a realistic view of himself, all right? Sometimes I don't think we have a realistic view of ourselves. So I think it's a great question. Are you spiritually mature enough that whenever suffering comes, to be able to see that suffering as God sees it. So, so here's, a, here's a great question, and, and may, maybe you can't answer it right now. But what Bible passages would you cling to if you were faced with a terminal illness? Or if you were faced with the death of a child? Or if you were faced with financial insecurity? What passages would you cling to? If you don't know any, I'd love to help you with that. So, so let me pause for a second. I'm always talking to you about books. I'm reading a book right now. The, the, this book is really good. I get all my books from my son. So Mark and Justin recommend all of my books to me. So Justin sends me a picture of this book the other day and says, Dad, you ought to read it. It's called Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy. And it talks about when you go through suffering, learning to, to pray the prayers of lament. And actually goes through and talks about out of the 150 psalms, more than a third of those psalms are prayers of lament. And in our culture, which we emphasize everything from prosperity and all of that, we have ignored the psalms of lament. And we haven't learned how to lament. And so, man, there's some great psalms in here that this guy takes and fleshes out. Psalm 77 and, and Psalm 13 and some other psalms that were psalms of lament that, that are great psalms to cling to whenever you go through loss or whenever you go through suffering. So the question is this. I mean, you know, not if you read the book, but the question is this. Whenever that suffering comes, what Bible passages are you going to cling to? Because you're going to need them. Here's another question. Do you feel free to share your most personal feelings with God? That's a great question. Sometimes we feel like we need to be almost hypocritical with God as if, as if everything's okay and not share our innermost feelings. And God wants to hear our innermost feelings. Then the last question I would ask in the series is this. So where are you, as we come to a close tonight, where are you on your sanctification journey? What is, what is your next step? As I said in the very beginning, I've said a couple times tonight, our goal is not just to learn. Our goal is to grow. And I really would encourage you tonight, tomorrow, sometime in the next few days, to kind of just spend some time and get alone with God and do a little bit of a self-evaluation. Okay, God, where am I? So God, what, what from what we've learned the last few weeks do I need to put into practice? Am I spending enough time in your presence? Am I beholding you? Am I submissive to the Holy Spirit of God? Am I willing, whenever he indicates something in my life that I need to change, am I willing to change that? Those are great questions for you just to get alone with God and ask those questions and allow the Holy Spirit of God to work in your life because God wants to change you into his image.